So uh, hello, everyone, as, as everyone begins to funnel in, uh, but welcome to yet another John Quincy M. Society digital discussion. Uh, my name is Ryan Knuckles, and I am a program associate with the Society. Uh, before we get tonight's event started, uh, I'm going to let you know about some of our upcoming events and opportunities that you may be interested in. Uh, first, we're accepting uh, submissions to our annual student foreign policy essay contest with the National Interest Magazine. Uh, there are three prompts to choose from, and the winners will be published. They'll receive a cash prize, uh, among other things. Soon, I'll drop a link in, a, uh, in the chat where you can learn more about the prompts, prizes, and how to submit your essay. Um, also, next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the JQIS chapter at the University of Notre Dame will be hosting Jeremy Shapiro, uh, who's the policy director at the European Council on Foreign Relations and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution to talk about the temptation of American leadership and world affairs. Uh, and also on March 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll be hosting MIT professor Barry Posen to talk about U.S. grand strategy and the importance of military restraint. Uh, I'll be dropping links uh, in the chat to our essay contest in, the event, in these events very soon. Uh, but now let's get started with the, with the reason you all, all are here. Uh, I'm very excited to, in, to introduce Rafia Nakfi, who's the president of the JQAS chapter at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and she's going to introduce the chapter uh, and Professor Kong. So uh, Rafia, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Rafia. I'm, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to have our first speaker in our speaker series this semester. Um, so, Professor Kong is a Maria Crutcher Professor in International Relations, Business, and East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Southern California with appointments in both the School of International Relations and the Marshall School of Business. He is also the director of the Korean Studies Institute at USC, and his latest book released in 2017 and published by was published by the University Press and is called American Grand Strategy and East Asian Security in the 21st Century. While publishing in academic journals such as International Security and International Organization, he has also written opinion articles in the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Washington Post, and more. And he also received his Bachelor's of Arts with honors from Stanford, um, his university, university PhD from Berkeley, and I'm really excited to welcome Professor Kong. Um, and before I turn it over to him, I just wanted to uh, name a few of our Berkeley exec board members. So we have Cameron, Lauren, Clarissa, um, Mario, and they'll all be helping answer the questions during the Q&A portions. But uh, with that said, Professor Kong, welcome, and I'm turning it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Rafia. Thanks, Ryan and John, for inviting me. I always like to do things with uh, John Quincy Adams Society. Uh, so this is this is nice because as much as I wish I was there in person, I can do a lot more because of course we don't have to travel as much. So there really is a, a trade-off on everything. And I'd also wanna say, I am part of a third generation Cal family. My folks met at Cal back in the 50s. I went there and my sister's son also went to Cal. He graduated last year, so uh, go Bears, right? No. Anyway, it's a great school. So um, what I'm gonna do is talk to you today. I was asked to talk about um, uh, East Asian security. And I'm gonna flip back and forth a little bit here. Let me go to uh, this. Between uh, using the uh, the slides and then hopefully just staring at you, right? You get to look at me. Uh, but you know, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna try and take shorter rather than longer, but we'll see how it goes. And I'm calling it surprising stability in East Asia uh, because, I come to a point in um, concluding about US foreign policy that we don't need to be so forward leaning and that we don't need to think of everything in military terms through a deep knowledge of what's going on in East Asia. And I think essentially almost all of us in America have it wrong. Um, now kids, if you don't learn anything today, stay off the social media. That's the one thing I want you to learn. But if you do go, every now and then I tweet, and almost the only things I tweet is evidence from the region that shows it's not as bad as we all think it is. And you know what? They're not thinking about us, although we think they are. So I'm gonna go through this a little bit. And I'm gonna start out by something which is, this is the standard way we think about um, East Asia, which is by thinking about Europe. 
right? I mean, this is just all of you who do I or poli sci, all your classes, all the examples are from Europe, right? So Thucydides trap, you've probably heard about this, power transitions, uh, the lessons of history, which are always the European lessons of history, in 12 of the past 16 cases, in which a rising power, blah, 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 there is war, right? So the conclusion, of course, is uh, China's rising. America's already number one. It must be war, head for the hills, right? Well, I submit to you that the situation in East Asia is actually very different than uh, much of the uh, blathering on the DC blob will, will um uh, would lead you to believe. Here is what I think the region is thinking about. This, I shouldn't have given it away. I was going to make you guess, but I mean, you know, who knows? A quick show of hands. Who knows what this is? Shanghai, right? This is Shanghai in 1987, before most of you were born. Long before you were born now, I guess, right? Looks fine. Yay. This is what it looks like now. Has anybody been? I mean, actually, I can't see you guys. I can't see that many. But um, if, any, if anyone's been to Shanghai, you realize it doesn't look like that, man. <laughs> it looks like this, right? It's insane. Shanghai's incredible. I would normally say if this were a class, I would say, who knows what this is? Probably none of you do. That's the Seoul train station from around 1960. I should have a modern photo because they, they left that. And they built over it a massive modern train station now. You can barely see this thing, right? Like the old timey bus and of course the lady with the stuff on her head. This is Korea in the 1960s, Seoul, downtown Seoul. Notice all the Chinese use of Chinese, by the way, Chinese characters, Mi Yong Shil there, right? Um, that's Korea today. If anyone's been to Seoul today, you know, it doesn't, doesn't look like this anymore. It looks like this. And I submit to you that all the first although the first half of the 20th century, uh, what occupied East Asian minds was war and imperialism. From Japanese imperialism to the Pacific War, uh, you know, the Korean War, et cetera. By 1975, the last main civil war was over, the Vietnamese Civil War, right? The last half century, of East Asia has been about business, not war. And when they wake up this morning, whether it's leaders or elites or, or you know, the every, every, everyday persons, they're thinking about other stuff. They're thinking about business. They're not worried about great power competition or war. Despite China's rise, which I call a return. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna talk about how we think about China. And I'm gonna call it a return because you know what? China's always been big, man. Every now and then they go through like a hundred years, which you know is seems like a long time, but is not in the sweep of 2000 years of history, which they just did. Uh, and for some reason, a unified China usually reemerges and we are seeing a return, not a rise. This is not new in East Asia. I'm gonna talk about that. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the view from the region. Talk about Korea, Japan, a little bit, ASEAN, and then we'll conclude by talking about the United States. And hopefully I will um, uh, uh, be provocative enough. I will be, I'll be insightful and provo provocative and, and annoying enough that you uh, learn something. And we'll conclude by talking about business, not war. So what do you mean by rapid return, right? Number one, for all the bleating and whining and hair pulling about um, a power transition, certainly in East Asia, power transition's over, man. We don't have to worry about it. It's already done, right? The question is how, how much bigger is China gonna get? So here's a typical way we measure the size of countries. Populations on the uh, Y axis, uh, land mass is on the X axis. Like how big are these countries, right? And again, if this were a longer class, I'd make you guess. How many of you know the population of Japan? 120 million, 130 million, right? Philippines, 100 million. Singapore, <laughs> 4 million. Uh, but it looks the way we think countries look, right? This sort of multipolar, everybody's roughly the same size. And that makes sense, right? That's what East Asia actually looks like. 
It is China is so much bigger than everybody else. You can't fit them on the same scale. That little dot down there of Japan, right? I could, the 48 is Korea. You can't get them on the same scale. That's how much bigger China is than everybody else. And that's the reality of the situation. Right? When China went through some problems, we all wondered what was gonna happen, but it's not a surprise that it's big again. So this is how rapidly China regained its position of centrality in East Asia. This is just a share of total trade. If you take those countries down below, you add up the amount they trade and then the amount they trade with each other and who takes that? China in uh, 1996 took about 10% of uh, Asian trade. Japan was mammoth with giant 25% of trade. Those lines crossed maybe 20 years ago. And I'd going back, man, doesn't matter what happens in China. It's not getting any, you know, it's not getting any different, right? This is how quickly China became the world economic, you know, an economic powerhouse once it decided to stop the centrally planned economy. There are huge problems with sort of, uh, uh, you know, unfettered free market, blah, blah, whatever, right? But clearly it works better than a centrally planned economy. Um, here's the short share of total East Asian GDP gross domestic product over the last 30 years. The same thing, we all basically know it, but it is so vivid how much bigger China is now than everybody else. In 1990, Japan took two thirds of the entire, if you added up the GDPs of all those countries, Japan would be two thirds of the pie. China was 10% of the pie. Those lines crossed, they're never coming back. And so when we talk about the centrality of China, it's way more real than, than we're sort of thinking about it now. Now, this is what's fascinating. This is military expenditures of those same 11 countries as a proportion of their economy over the last 30 years. And what you see is a steady generations long reduction in the proportion of the economy that these countries are devoting to the military. Every year, every country has a big debate about how to spend money on education or roads or the military. And in every country, year after year in East Asia, the, the, the decision has been, yeah, we'll spend a little less. Yeah, we'll spend a little less. And I'm happy to talk about it. But no matter how you measure it, in absolute terms, we'll talk about it a bunch of ways. The point being, every year, there has been a basically a reduction, which does not fit uh, our, um, whoops, where is it? Which does not fit our expectation about what should happen in the region. This is entirely the opposite of what that uh, Graham Allison or whoever else would have you believe. The bigger the China gets, the more afraid everybody else should be. That's not what is happening in East Asia. The exact opposite is happening. Nobody is spending more, they're spending less. We have to start with that view of the region. They could spend more. They're spending 2.5 of their economy, percent of their economy. They're down to less than 2% of the economy on defense. They can always go back up to 2.5%. They are choosing not to. And so if we start with that description of the region, where are we? There we are. Uh, let's look at sort of how these countries are, are responding a little bit. Because again, you'd think the bigger that China gets, and it is so much bigger, all the other countries in the region would be afraid. So why are they behaving the way they behave? Well, I usually start with Korea because in many ways, uh, Korea is not only the coolest country. Um, Korea is the canary in the coal mine. If something's going to happen, it's going to start on the Korean Peninsula. They're right next to China. They have to make a decision in the way that countries that are separated by water might not have to. And what I say again and again, whenever I do this to like the military or in DC, I try to explain that the Koreans, they're not dumb. They're not irrational. It's that Koreans share some, but not all American priorities. And fundamentally, 
Koreans do not view China as a threat the same way Americans constantly tell them they should. So there was a dispute over uh, this, this uh, um, uh, radar display called THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense or something like that, that the US put in South Korea, China got mad. Well, they sorted it out. China did not actually put on economic sanctions. Korea didn't give in. The batteries are still there, but they sorted it out. This was a couple of years ago and everybody at the time said, ah, this is it, Koreans hate China. From now on, they're on our side 100%. And I was like, no, I don't think that's how it's gonna work. And sure enough, uh, President Moon, you know, took a couple of months and they sorted it out. Koreans do not view China as an existential threat. And yet there is a country they do. And it's a country most Americans say, what are you thinking about? You're focused on the wrong thing. This is an opinion poll. Let me, uh, is there a way, let me try to move this. Can you guys see the one over there on the right? I'm Shinzo Abe. Okay, if yes, if you minimize, if you guys minimize your, your screen or something like that, right? What you can see, if you mi minimize that little grid video thing on the right, you can see this is an opinion poll. I chose two, but this is consistent over like 40 years. This is leader of favorability. So in 2017, 2018, after the Thad controversy, if you know about that, uh, Trump gets a five. American leaders, they always like American leaders. Xi Jinping at a four. Kim Jong-un as a four. Japan's Abe at a two. <laughs> and we think, oh, that's just one poll. Oh, they're, you know, they're ridiculous. Here's another poll. Whoops, I'll go. 2019, same thing, Donald Trump, uh, China, Xi Jinping, and Kim Jong-un, and then Abe, about half, right? Consistently, you, you, no matter how you measure it, you end up with Koreans view China, uh, Japan as a much greater threat than China. They are much more comfortable with Xi Jinping and Chinese leaders than they are with Japanese leaders. Again and again and again. You do not see Koreans viewing China as a military threat. Americans like, how can that be? Don't they get it? The Japanese people are so nice. They're so nice. Why are these Koreans not making sense? Well, we don't have to like it. And this is what I say. They share some, but not all American priorities. We don't have to like how they view it. The best way that I found to explain why Koreans view Japan with a lot more skepticism than we think they should and with more skepticism than they view China, is this. Again, for anyone who's been there, this is uh, Kwang Hwamun, it's the King's Palace. It was the palace of the King of the Chosun Dynasty for about 500 years. You can see the gate, the three big uh, uh, hall, you know, uh, entryways, et cetera, et cetera. This is in 1905, right before the Japanese um, uh, imperialism, so they took over Korea. As you can see, this is great pungsu, great uh, feng shui. This is a north, the mountain is to the north. It's south facing. Can you see me? There, it's south facing. And right below it is a river, is water, which is a Chungaechun, that beautiful river that they've redone, if you know it. Great Pungsu, great feng shui. Well, when the Japanese took over, they built a, a colonial administration building. How come there? It's, I'm not centraling, there we go, right? They built a colonial administration building. That's where they built it. Boom. In the middle of the palace courtyard. There is no better way to visualize the way the Koreans view it, the way the Japanese viewed the Koreans. And if you look from the top, if anybody knows Chinese characters, if you look at that building from the top, it is written in the, in the character of ill or Japan. <laughs> the building is built as a uh, Japan uh, uh, on a Japan uh, thing. There, I think this is his best way to get a visceral sense of the Japanese treatment of Koreans and then the Korean view of them. We say, well, that was a hundred years ago. But I don't know how many of you heard about the Harvard thing, right? But there is an ongoing controversy over uh, forced sexual um, uh, slavery uh, for the Japanese army. 
And for everyone who says, well, you know, those Japanese don't mean it. They're the ones that keep bringing it up. <laughs> they keep getting mad at these, at these um, statues demanding to get taken down. There's a controversy over the one in Glendale. The Japanese government is constantly asking for it to be taken down. It's not a dead thing. And for anyone who thinks that was history and only the Asians have a problem with history, just look at what happened in our country a couple months ago. Right? It's not dead, man. It's not over. And this is takes two to tango on this. So, oh, let me a couple more things, right? So here's a uh, that's me at the National Assembly. Uh Yazukuni Shrine, etc. There's a lot of ways in which we have um uh, unresolved issues. And that's okay. That's fine. All countries do. And as I said, we do as well. The issue though, for us in the United States, when we look at Asian countries and say, don't you realize you should be afraid of China? That's not the way it's going to work. So for us to try and force them into our um, mindset is, is uh, not very successful. And there's another reason as well. And I'll point this out. During the Korean War, let's look at the Chinese side. Why do the Koreans not uh, that afraid of China? They don't have to like them, right? You know, China's a bully. It can be pushy. But that doesn't mean you're going to like, you know, uh, uh, take one side completely, right? During the Korean War in 1950, there were two superpowers that sent massive amounts of troops to the Korean Peninsula. One of those superpowers... Within five years, by 1958, all the troops were out of, out of the pencil and back home. The other superpower is clinging like grim death to those bases. It's not China. Hint, hint, it's not China that's clinging like grim death to those bases, right? Which is why, and I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, but anytime anyone says, you know, does China have designs on the Korean Peninsula and blah, 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 I'm like, no, no. You know, they easily could have stayed there, man. They easily could have stayed in North Korea, but they didn't. Um, and as I point out now, North Korea is not a prize. Nobody wants North Korea. <laughs> you know, and so the Koreans know the Chinese have commercial interests. They have diplomatic interests. You know, they, they can be pushy. But no one seriously makes the argument that China wants to invade and conquer Korea. And so the Koreans aren't acting as if they did. Now, what about Japan? Because if there is one country that could, um, oops, be worried about China and actually try and do something, it's Japan. Japan was the biggest country in East Asia, as we saw that, that data before, right? Japan during the 20th century was without question the closest to a peer competitor, as we call it. Uh, of uh, the United States. But in 1990, 1992, the bubble on their economy burst and they went through a lost decade when, they did, when Japan did not make the necessary economic reforms. Uh, so growth would have been four or five, 8% was down to about 1% a year, economic growth. By now, they're calling it a lost generation because over the last 30 years, Japan has averaged less than 1% growth over those 30 years. They have foregone trillions of dollars of potential economic um, gains. And I wanna point something out. We all are focused on China's South China Sea's uh, claims. Often China is blamed for everything, you know, and men, like they are, they're very pushy, no question about it. But I wanna point out, the territorial disputes are not China's origin. Japan has territorial disputes with every single country that it could have territorial disputes with. They still haven't resolved the Russian dispute over the Northern Territories arising from the 1904 war. Bokdo and Takeshima is that picture I showed you. Uh, one thing that North and South Korea can agree on, those islands are Korean. <laughs> Japan clings to those like grim death as well, right? And of course, over the Senkakus, both Taiwan and PRC claim those islands. It's not like Taiwan is any nicer towards Japan. 
Japan has territorial disputes with every single country that it could have territorial disputes with. It's not like Taiwan's willing to make a deal with Japan and the Japanese can get along with Taiwan and China's the stub stubborn refusal. Japan has not resolved any of its territorial disputes. This is a region-wide problem. It's also at the margins of the territorial grid, which is one reason it's not that big a deal. Nobody thinks Japan wants to colonize uh, Taiwan anymore, right? But here's the e economy, another way to look at it in absolute constant dollars. Japan was at $2 trillion uh, in 1971. By 1990, that was about four or so. They're now up to $6 trillion and it's basically been flat since 2000. And China, if Japan had had anywhere near the type of economic growth that they uh, uh, could with the economic reforms, they could be so much bigger. The problem of course, is this, the Japanese don't feel the same type of national security emergency that they felt in the late 19th century. The arrival of the black ships. If you, anybody gets a chance, you should go to Yasukuni Shrine and you should see the museum. It's amazing. I went with this amazing friend of mine, Dave Laney. He's, he's a professor at Waseda right now. Fabulous to have him around, just sort of reading things, interpreting. Even if you, you, know, you can read it, they inter he interpreted what meaning was. Yasukuni Shrine, which is a, which is a um, you know, shrine to, the museum is a shrine to Japanese militarism. The first exhibit is Perry's black ships. And they're like, this is where it all started, man, those Americans. But the reaction of Japan in the 19th century was unbelievable. Within a generation, they had, they had uh, become the first non-Western country to industrialize. They'd become the first non-Western country to beat a Western country in a war, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904. It was insane what they did. That was a country that said, our national survival is under threat, let's do something. So the fact that they're not is evidence that they don't view it as a national survival issue. And they don't, China's not gonna invade Japan, nobody thinks that. And so Japan is not acting as if it were. The total non-response of the Japanese politics, economy, society is evidence that they don't view it as a actual survival threat, a national security threat. And I will show you, here's their military expenditures over 30 years. In absolute dollars, it's gone up about $5 billion. It's essentially flat. The Japanese could be spending five times this if they wanted to. So $41 billion in 1990, $46 billion in 2019. <laughs> Every year, every year, and here's, here's something else, kids, you should remember this. Every year you should read, around now, Japan will release a budget, and every year somebody in the diplomat or the national interest or something will write a, an article, Japan is rearming! And I always say, well, I'll wait, to, I'll believe it when I see it. Because every year there's like a 0.1% increase. A better way to look at it is this. This is this constant defense spending of China, Japan, and the Philippines. This is not a country that's re responding to China. It's just not. It is very, very hard to look at this data and say, well, the Japanese, they really are secretly scared and pretty soon they're gonna do something about it. I just don't see the data for that. Well, the data I see is the Japanese may not like China. They may think it's a bully, whatever else, but they're not, it's not enough for them to actually do something about it. Let me try and hurry up, but we're, well, I think we're doing good time. Uh, let me talk about ASEAN and just briefly about ASEAN, right? Um, ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There's 10 members there. Um, something I should say, there are a couple trade uh, groups that got started, RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, something like that, right? Uh, TPP. We view TPP as an American thing, an American initiative, and RCEP as a Chinese initiative. Both of those were regional initiatives, right? RCEP came from ASEAN first. TPP, I think, sort of is a Japanese idea. We only view these things in the US-China lens, but that's not the case, right? 
ASEAN clearly, all the countries in ASEAN clearly do not want to make a choice between the US and China. They increasingly are expecting not to. And their diplomacy is aimed at finding a way in between these two superpowers, making sure that those two don't start butting heads. And the best example of that um, is that uh, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore does an annual survey of elites at think tanks and governments and militaries around the region. And they just, um, uh, they just released this like last week, it was great. You know, the amount of, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm being, I'm maybe, am I being too snarky to the DC blob? Never, never. John you Quincy Borg, tell me, am I <laughs> not head if I'm being too snarky? Okay, because like, never be. it's just so aggravating because the amount of, everybody looked to see the US China thing. The overwhelming argument was, <laughs> okay, I, I saw the chat box, right? Um, the amount of focus was on, does ASEAN like China better or the US better? China, be you know, and there was some minor movement in sort of China down and US up. And we're like, aha, we're number one. What the, the most important finding from that was what do China, uh, what do ASEAN uh, people think about when they wake up in the morning? Their three most important priorities are not our priorities. So these, are they so ISES said, what are the three top challenges facing Southeast Asia? And I'm just going to give you a, a minute to read through these. I thought about, should I put them all up here? And then I thought I'll give you a minute just to read through them. Overwhelmingly, it's economic and business issues, COVID, public health, unemployment. By far, those are the two biggest ones. And then, of course, domestic income uh, inequality. When leaders and elites wake up in East Asia, that's what they're worried about. That's what they think about. Even the one that came in number four is um, climate change. And number five is domestic political instability. You have to get down to number six till you get uh, great power or flashpoints, right? Great power competition. It's really worth taking a moment and saying, we look at the land issue at the area through our lens, but that's not the lens that they're using. When they wake up, they're concerned about business and society. Now, why would that be? Essentially, Again, it goes back to, if you go back, I, I think you guys have had enough time to see this. I'll, I'll happy to share it if you want. I mean, you know, if you want, I can email you the, the PowerPoint, right? Um, just make sure to cite me slavishly. No, um, doesn't matter. I, I'm happy to, because it's, you know, there's some, there's some great data on there. Like, here's what a social scientist is. We like to count stuff. Fundamentally, that's social science. And boy, do I like to count stuff. Um, why? Why is that what they're concerned about? If you go back to 1900 or 1950, petering out by 1975, almost every country in the region feared for its survival. China, Korea, Vietnam, they were either colonized or worried about being col you know, conquered or worried about being colonized, right? Some of them hadn't ever become countries the way we think of them, Indonesia, et cetera. 1950, they're all new countries. Indonesia exists, uh, Malaysia after British rule. They're sorting it out. Lots of domestic insurgencies. The Philippines was a US colony until 1946. It was civil war in Korea, civil war in Vietnam till 1975. Confrontazi, for those of you from Southeast Asia, right? Um, between Indonesia and Malaysia in the 60s where thousands and thousands of people were killed. Australia was deeply involved in that. Countries feared for their survival and there was very little domestic political stability. If you come forward to today, there are only two countries that fear for their survival. Again, if it was a class, I'd make you guess. Taiwan and North Korea. And both of those are arguably internal or civil debates. These are not 
actual land grabs where a China is saying, I'm going to take over Vietnam. We can debate Taiwan China thing, but it's pretty much an you know inter thing, just like Korea, right? It's an internal uh, issue among Koreans. So only two countries fear for their survival. So the region is not acting as if their survival was threatened because it's not. At the same time, economic growth in these countries has been unbelievably fabulous. Go back to those pictures at the beginning of the talk. When they wake up, that's what they worry about. So let me conclude. Um, oh, some stuff in the chat, okay. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, blah, 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 right? Let me conclude. Oops, there we go. East Asia is more stable than we think. It is not teetering on the edge of like uh, great power competition and a massive multipolar scramble for arms races or something like that. The evidence I've shown you, and I, you know, there is more, but it's just more of the same, leads to the conclusion that the story of East Asia over the last half century has been business, not war. It is more stable today than it was 50 years ago. Imagine the end of Vietnam War, 1975, or Korean War, 1950, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Compared to that, it is way more stable, rich, and integrated than it has been in the last 100 years. The other point about China, East Asians have always lived with the big China. They always will, and nobody's moving away, man. I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that most American policymakers and uh, 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 policy analysts, you know, the, the sort of uh, DC types have. China's not going away. China's not a problem to be solved. The idea never was that somehow, uh, you know, 30 years ago, we'd become a democracy and problem solved, next, right? That was never gonna happen. It is never gonna happen now. In some ways, the Cold War really hurt the way we think about IR because Soviet Union did disappear and was like problem solved. But that's not the case. China's not going anywhere. China's not a problem to be solved. It's a massive thousands of year old civilization that we all have to live with one way or another. We don't even have to like it. You don't have to like it. China can be pushy, man, but we're gonna have to live with it. So finally, what about the US? Let me do a little bit more, right? This is not a strategy. This just makes my head spin around. We loudly trumpet our phone ops, which is, um, oh geez, what does it stand for? Freedom of navigation operations, right? That's barely a tactic. We're like, this is what's gonna solve everything in, in South China Seas. We send our ships through to prove that China doesn't have a claim there, right? That is not a strategy, man. And I will tell you that the long-term stable solution to the region is not going to be military. It's going to be diplomatic. So we might send this once in a while as part of a larger diplomatic strategy in the region. And if you go back to the ASEAN uh, survey, elites throughout Southeast Asia don't want the US to use its military. They want diplomatic efforts by the United States. I should have put that one up there too. It's a great, you should read the survey, right? In terms of military spending, every time, you know, the amount of bleating over Chinese uh, defense spending, if there's one thing I could change about the domestic American debate, everybody left and right, Democrat and Republican throws more money at the military. Some of my best friends are in the military, right? So it's not, you know, it's not a crack on the military, but we have become Sparta in our, in our uh, sort of glorification of the US military. Despite the fact that this country is founded on civilian control of the military. We are the safest country in the world and we outspend China three to one. If there's anybody who's making things more dangerous, it's the United States. We do not need to spend that much. Um, and I will stop there. Uh, so let me, let me conclude by saying, as a US grand strategy to the region, it's not going to be a military solution. 
we should not be leaning forward with our chin trying to see whether China will take a poke at it. It is a regional, multilateral, diplomatic solution to what's going on. And that is especially the case because China does not threaten the survival of any country in the region other than Taiwan. And so a strategy that emphasizes economic and diplomatic ties uh, and social ties is the path forward. One thing I will just, I will stop with, I, sh I should have put this up and then I'll, we'll talk, but there's just so much to say. You know, China now, China in, in 2000, I was looking this up for, for a, a new book on power transitions, but China in 2000 sent 50,000 uh, uh, students to the United States. By 2018, 350,000 Chinese students. We should be taking twice as many, man, right? I can't imagine a better way to help us get along with China. Uh, so I will stop there. And I'd be delighted. I'll look forward to a, uh, whatever you guys want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kong. So yes, we'll be moving to Q&A uh, now. And again, if you have any questions, please just put them in the Q&A tab. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off and ask the first question from Crystal Lynn. Uh, she asks, could you argue that the U.S. presence uh, in East Asia is what makes East Asia spend less on its military each year? And also, how would you respond uh, to these for uh, how would you respond to the militarization of the South China Sea uh, that's been going on? How would you respond yeah. to that? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the standard response. So very good from uh, whoever said that, Clarissa Rie or something, right? Great. Uh, the standard response is, well, of course, they're not spending because we're doing it for them. Now, I have a chart which I should have had ready. You can look at defense spending by U.S. allies and defense spending by non-U.S. allies like Malaysia and Vietnam. If the U.S. deterrent was protecting our allies, they should be free riding and spending less. But the countries where we have no expectation that the U.S. will defend them should be spending more. Everybody comes down the same way. I will add that to the chart and I'll send it in case uh, you guys want, or you can email me if you want, right? Um, I can't promise to reply, but no, I'll do my best, right? But but yes, I mean, you can just see, you can see, do the non-allies respond better than the allies? And the answer is no, they're all the same. Everybody's moving down. And briefly on the militarization, the thing that bothers me about that is, you know, China may be doing it a little bit bigger, but everybody is reclaiming land. Everybody has made airfields. And the first countries to put an airfield in was like the Philippines and Vietnam about 40 years ago in the 1970s. So yeah, it'd be great if China stopped, but everybody else needs to stop too. Rafi, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, I'll ask the next question from David Zhao. It says, why do you think DC is so focused on China as an existential military threat to US interests? despite China's um, military expenditure as being a minimal percentage of their GDP, yeah. GDP um, it seems like uh, it seems to be more focused on military build out and its growing threat. And it asks, where does this uh, threat perception come from? You know, I'll bet both Ryan and John can do a better job answering that than me. I mean, my, my you know, my sense is having, having watched the Soviet Union, in a lot of ways was really convenient, meaning it was a clear enemy. It was an evil empire. Boy, that made sense, right? When that fell apart, I we watched. You know, we went through decades of trying to choose this, that, and the other thing, right? And uh, terrorism tried to fit, but it's so amorphous, and et cetera, et cetera. China fits. China makes an easy enemy. It's true they're not nice. You know, they're pushy on a lot of things. That's fine. But I think it is. It has been, especially in the last couple of years a just surge, I have seen a surge. And this is why I actually will call it a blob because I've been amazed. Even a couple years ago in DC, you got a lot of debate. And in the last couple of years, whoosh, everybody has run over to the, we tried democracy, they didn't become a democracy, right? Um, I see John uh, nodding his head. I mean, I've just been amazed at how much the, the tenor of across the board has shifted to the China threat. Um, and I think there's an element of herd mentality to it. Um, Nobody wants to seem really that different, you know? Um, I'll give you one example. I do a lot of talks like this. Uh, I just did one last week to one of the military units, US military. I always get introduced the same way. And now for an unconventional perspective. 
And I have a joke. I've heard it so often now. I have a joke. I'm like, it's not that unconventional. <laughs> I'm wearing a tie. You know, I'm wearing a suit. You know, I'm not a hippie with my, you know, like some, you know, I'm wearing a suit, right? Because it's not that unconventional. But boy, they just sort of go along. And I, I just think it's an easy sort of group think kind of thing. Mario, if you want to go ahead. Sure, David. The next question is from Bradley Lentz, uh, Professor King uh, Kong. Um, is it Kang or Kong? So we can be we can be clear. Uh, either one. Kong okay. Kong is you know preferred, but Kang is fine too. Either's fine. All right, we'll, we'll go. I've Kong. been called both. I've been called worse. <laughs> um, American national security officials and strategy documents often characterize the PRC as a rising threat to be countered. What effect do you think these characterizations and related rhetoric have on China's own national security strategy? You know, that's actually a great question because it turns it back to how do the Chinese view it? Let me say the first thing is, and here's why I actually am relatively hopeful over the long run about US policy towards China. China does not pose an existential threat to the survival of the United States. Nobody makes that argument. I must've been in like 50 great power competition conferences over the last couple of years. I mean, one a month almost, right? Uh, and no matter what people say about worst case, well, you know, in 30 years, they, if Huawei, blah, 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 nobody says China wants to invade and conquer the United States. Nobody says that. Nobody even says China is a secondary threat to the United States, meaning does China pose a existential threat to our allies? Nobody thinks that. Nobody argues Chinese are going to try and invade and conquer China, uh, Japan. Nobody says that. At best, China is a tertiary threat to the margins of the territorial grid over some uninhabited islands. And the question for us is, over a generation, is that what's going to motivate and animate the American people and even Congress or whatever else to, to fight over it? I really find that hard to imagine. So yeah, there could be mistakes and stuff, but this is not an existential threat. The Soviet Union was, the Soviets wanted to, but China doesn't, they do not have those. Nobody makes that argument, right? Um, it's more vague, it's Huawei and cyber and China, you know, being a bully, South China Seas. So how does that affect the Chinese? Um, I think they are very aware of how they are viewed by the United States. And for a long time, I think they tried a lot harder to, you know, uh, be calm about it. But I think two things happen. If I think about what Xi Jinping worries about, it's all domestic for him as well. I truly think China is more focused on domestic than international. Uh, and secondly, I think they have uh, are figuring out how best to do this. And our expectation that somehow they are always going to be meek and mild just because we want them to, I think that is a naive expectation, man. Lauren, if you want to go ahead and ask the next question. Hi, um, Samuel Leder uh, is asking, I noticed you define the region as East Asia, but today following Jap Japan's lead, the US defines the region as Indo-Pacific. Um, notably, that includes India, which would change our perception of the distribution of population in the region. And also India is a country that saw a border conflict with China last year. Why do you focus on East Asia here? Um, okay, so that's a great question. Uh, most interesting is the border because, you know, they're, they're sorting that out. They bam, bam, bam. And then they, you know, dismantle various guard posts and stuff like that. Right. Um, so a couple of things, number one, there's the quad. I'll come back to the quad because I think that is an aspirational dream. That's never going to happen, man. Uh, but we'll come back to that. That is an American attempt to draw a line across the region. The reason that I focus on East Asia is this India is not a fact. When, when I define a region, sort of the way I define a region is where the units have to interact and pay attention to each other. That's a unit. I mean, that's a region. That's a system where the units regularly interact. If I think of the major issues in East Asia, North Korea, South China Seas, Taiwan, does anybody know what India thinks about them? No. Do you know why? They don't matter. That's why we define the issues that way. EU, we're not telling the EU, you know, they may have an opinion about it, but no one says, what is India going to do about Taiwan? That's not on the plate. So the region is functionally about those types of issues. But we do care what Japan will do, or the Vietnam will do, or Malaysia will do. 
So that's why I don't include India on these things. India has a South Asian issue with China, with Pakistan, with Af et cetera, et cetera. You know what, when we talk about like AFPAC or what's going on in Afghanistan, do you know who we don't ask? What does Japan think? You know, they're not in that region. Or what's Vietnam's stance towards Afghanistan? That's a different region. And India really matters on that. So they're not in this region over here, right? So that's why I don't include them. As to Indo-Pacific, the US has been talking about that for a long time. Do you know who's the most reluctant of the four? The quad is Japan, uh, Australia, oh, America, Japan, Australia, and India. Do you know who's most reluctant? India. <laughs> it was really interesting. Pompeo went over there last year and he got a cold shoulder from Modi, right? They're not interested in that. They have their own issues with China, but India does not want to get dragged into a bunch of issues, again, that are not their main concern. And so India is very skeptical about that. I am skeptical about the Quad because to me, this seems to be conceding everything to China, <laughs> right? The entire main part of maritime and, and mainland East Asia, we're gonna give it to China. We're gonna step at the most peripheral units, Japan, Australia, and India. That's how we're gonna start. That to me, that seems to be conceding everything. Because interesting enough, I've been to Australia once. It's really far away. <laughs> I flew from America to do a talk at ANU, right? So I'm, I'm at Canberra. And then I thought it would be a really quick jump up to uh, Seoul. It was as long to go to, from, to, to Seoul from Canberra as it was to go from America. It's really far away. <laughs> you know, so, um, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical about the quad and the Indo-Pacific. That's our attempt to draw a line around stuff. That's not the way these Asians work, man. Uh, Cameron, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Professor, you made a sort of a distinction I noticed um, in like the geopolitical uh, you know, perspective of uh, Taiwan compared to other, let's say, U.S. allies in the region. So I was just curious about what's your take on um, current uh, you know, U.S. policy towards Taiwan and you know, yeah. what would your advice to, let's say, policymakers in, in you know, the D.C. You know, beltway, what, what would yeah. it be about that issue? You know, what was interesting about the Trump administration was they pushed as far as they possibly could to try and get Taiwan to be independent, so to speak. I mean, they really were inviting, you know, uh, people. They they were uh, changing sort of the way that we have a, we have a, I forget what it's called now, but it's the American something. It's not a consulate because we don't recognize Taiwan, right? Um, and there are real limits on that because the Taiwanese were very afraid to move too far either. One, I think one big um, thing that we overlook about Tsai uh, uh, Wen, uh, the, the current uh, uh, Taiwanese prime uh, president, is that even though she's you know, from DPP, she's not an independence activist looking to push the edge. The United States formally has a one China policy. We agree with both Taiwan and China that there's one China. We also explicitly say that resolution of who runs the whole China should be done peacefully. And in fact, almost every country in the world has a one China policy. Meaning we agree that they're basically one country. We also agree that they're disputing who's in charge of that one country. That has worked fairly well. What the Chinese have said on their side was, Taiwan can act like a free country. You can have your own currency, you can have your own government, you can have your own flag even, just don't call yourself independent. And that has worked. Compared to where we were 50, 60 years ago, there was active shelling between China and Taiwan in the 1950s. The Chinese somewhere around the 90s or so decided they were gonna play economic interdependence instead of balance of power. So instead of trying to pressure Taiwan, they decided to say, hey, open for business. And as you may know, 5% of Taiwanese moved back to China like within the first year. About, <laughs> you know, it's an amazing, the number of people that moved, about a million Taiwanese moved back. Um, and the Taiwanese government was trying to limit interactions because of course, if you allow free trade and travel, most Taiwanese are gonna start doing business in China, going back and forth and stuff like that. And so, yeah, there are tensions. Of course there are, and you know, there's plans from Taiwan. We always talk about, could Taiwan, you know, China invade Taiwan? But again, I think that there is a manageable status quo in place that all three sides, Taiwan, China, and the US understand how it works. 
And that status quo is actually working pretty well, especially when you compare that status quo to the North Korea, South Korea status quo, which is balance of power. It's a lot more stable on the Taiwanese peninsula. I'm I think so we have reasonable. Time. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so if Clar- Clarissa, if you want to go and ask the last question. Yeah, so kind of just following up on a similar note, um, Unki was actually asking that at the moment the United States is designated to lead South Korean troops if war were to erupt on the Korean peninsula, if South Korea is able to take this control from the U.S., how do you think this would affect relations among East Asian countries, particularly regarding North Korea, if at all? Yeah, that's a great question. About We call it OPCON, transfer, operational control. Uh, right now, because South Korean and U.S. militaries are so deeply integrated defending the peninsula, uh, you need one boss. You can't have two bosses trying to decide. So uh, the U.S. has sort of formal control in wartime. Uh, and the plan has been for a decade, probably even longer, uh, to move that back. I think it was 2000, anyway, yeah, over 10 years that U.S. has been planning to give operational control back to the Korean military. Um, and it's, in many ways, it's the Korean military that sort of pushes forward and then slows down. Uh, because you really need to be ready to do it. Uh, and so there's sort of political will to do it, but I'm not sure they are uh, practically ready to do it yet. Um, but the political, you know, the ramifications in many ways, I think would be very interesting because it really, it has taken, you know, if there is a um, unquestioned belief in the United States, it's that uh, the US troops must be there to defend South Korea. We've gone from having 100,000 troops and nuclear weapons in South Korea down to about 24,000 troops today. So that number is way down. You know, we could always flood and, you know, whatever, but the point is it's way down, right? Is it 100? You know, at what point do we lose our tripwire deterrent thing? You know, um, and it is a great question. What would happen if the US didn't have troops on the ground? There is an argument that the region might be actually more stable because often it's the US troops that are the ones that are doing the exercises and everything else. Certainly that's what the North Koreans claim. And the US has agreed at times, we understand that practicing amphibious insults might look threatening to North Korea. Um, you know, Could they get that same training outside of Korea uh, and still be ready if North Korea to surge? Yeah, probably, right? Um, but if you say that, Everyone in DC, anyone who sees this right now, who's not you know, a student is gonna roll their eyes and say that Kong guy is just so naive. What do you mean? We have to be there. Maybe. All right, I, so uh, okay, yeah. I think that's uh, all, the t- all the time we have tonight. Uh, thank you, Professor Kong for speaking to the JQIS at Berkeley chapter. I speak for hopefully everyone when they say they really appreciated the, this event and your presentation. Uh, just uh, a quick reminder to everyone, I dropped the link in the chat uh, a few minutes ago for our student essay contest. There's three prompts, one on uh, US troop levels in Iraq, uh, Syria, and Afghanistan one on strategic priorities under the Biden administration, another on burden sharing. Uh, There's a cash prize among other prizes. So just check out our website for more information on that. Um, Also, we have an event on March 3rd with MIT professor Barry Posen uh, on US grant strategy. Be sure to sign up and register for that. You can also look on our website for more information. Uh, but, But that's all for me. Thanks so much everyone for coming out tonight and have a great night. Thanks everybody. Bye.